I want to get personal. Annie Robertson is a third grade teacher in Grants Pass. When our students come to school, they're worried about things going on at home. They may not have enough food. They may not have a bed to sleep in. Parents are stressed and students are feeling that stress. Every day there are severe, violent, and disruptive behaviors in classrooms. These events vary from a few minutes to 45 minutes. In East Portland, an English learning specialist named Joyce Rosano. Room clears happen several times a week. These events disrupt everyone's learning. All students lose out while the room is being cleared. And in Eugene, third grade teacher Kathleen Brandt. Each room clear takes away at least 30 minutes of instruction. Students often need a debrief after a room is destroyed or lights are shattered from a thrown chair. These are stories told to the Student Success Committee over the last year about a mental health crisis that is blowing up classrooms with behavioral disorders and emotional outbursts. Why is this occurring? No one really knows for sure. Maybe it's that these kids were born during the recession and are distressed by the family traumas of things like home foreclosures or loss of jobs. Maybe it's the explosion of electronic devices. Maybe it's the fact that drugs, legal and illegal, have flooded our communities. But whatever the cause, teachers tell us that a crowded classroom of 30 today is much more perilous than a crowded classroom of 30 just five years ago. Now we can ignore this development and watch as graduation rates slide and high school dropouts join the ranks of poverty. But let's not be fooled, poverty is expensive, much more expensive than education. This new mental health crisis is compounding the problems that we already have, overcrowded classrooms, sh short school years, the loss of electives like music and drama. After decades of patching together school budgets that move us in the direction of where we should be, it's time to just get where we should be. Oregon's brilliance and the ability of her people to prosper is directly dependent on quality education. The legislation in front of you gives schools a pathway toward a different outcome, one that fuels a stronger workforce and college-ready re legions of young people. To pay for these changes, we're asking businesses who sell their products or services into Oregon to pay a little more. The Council on State Taxation, or cost, as Oregon currently ranks 44th in the country for state and local tax burden, making our state a low-cost state for business. Even with this change, the tax burden for business will move from 44th to 35th, still well below the national average. The Oregon Business and Industry Association, the state's largest business organization, is not opposing this bill. And I'm proud that during our committee work, we engaged OBI and other businesses, as well as labor unions, tax consultants, CPAs, economists. But I'm most proud of the fact that this bill was created, drafted, and written by policymakers in this building, no one else. It was done out in the open. All of our work, the rough drafts, the economic models, the rewrites, the amendments, all of it documented in public record for anyone to see. Now, one thing that businesses seem to have in common, they all opposed ballot measure 97 a couple of years ago. And at the time, they said they'd support something a little more reasonable. The biggest criticism of ballot measure 97 was that the rate was too high. The rate in this bill is about one-fifth that rate. The other criticism was that ballot measure 97 didn't spell out where the money would go. In this bill, it is all dedicated to K through 12 education and higher learning. And finally, ballot measure 97 did not protect Oregonians from price increases on things like groceries. In this bill, groceries are exempt, gas is exempt, healthcare is exempt, and it lowers personal income taxes for all Oregonians. This education bill is accountable, it is responsible, it is strong. I've been working toward an education package like this since I came to the legislature 18 years ago. And I was always told it was never really the right time. And this always reminded me about that story of the old man and the leaky roof. He wouldn't fix his leaky roof in the winter because it was raining out. And then he wouldn't fix it in the summer because it wasn't leaking. 
During the last two decades, we've had two really bad recessions. We couldn't pass an education package during those recession years, and we couldn't pass an education package during the recovery years either. People just seemed to shrug their shoulders and said, the roof isn't leaking. Well, this is our time. This is our time to fix this for education advocates, for parents, for students, for battle-weary teachers. It is our time. I've heard critics say over the years, ridiculously, that when you fix graduation rates, then you'll get our support. This bill has dozens and dozens of metrics, including graduation rates, that tie positive outcomes to financial certainty. This is our time. There will always be a reason to hold back and wait from an antiquated pension system created a generation ago to warnings about things unknown. I'm tired of those excuses. I'm done with them. Oregon young people need help, not excuses. And I am uplifted by the courage of my convictions that this is important, that this is a pivotal moment for our state. This time, we not only fix our leaky roof, we make education our highest priority. This is our time.